Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 1C. We're going to be talking about how we represent DNA. Re representation is really important for DNA because we can't actually see it. And this means we're very dependent on having conventions that everyone agrees on where we know what we're talking about when we draw something to represent DNA. So genetics is necessarily and has always been about things we can't see. In classical genetics, when genes were first discovered, they were purely hypothetical. Nobody had any idea of their properties at all. We know a lot more now. We know all about the molecules, but they're still too small for us to see. So we can't just look at them. We can make very accurate representations of the molecules. These are um, molecularly correct drawings of DNA molecules, but in fact, such representations are not very useful. They're much too detailed, unless you're a person who's physically studying the structure of DNA, which we're not. Um, we'll find that much simpler representations are much more useful. For example, often we will represent DNA and chromosomes by simply drawing a line. That's about as simple as a representation as you can get. Um, if we care about the orientation of the DNA, remember the business about 5' prime and 3' prime ends, we might use an arrow to mark the 3' prime end of the DNA. By convention, when we think about DNA, when we represent a single strand of DNA, we generally represent it from with the 5' prime end on the left and the 3' prime end on the right. Just as there's a convention for text, the same sort of convention applies for DNA. If we need to think about both strands, we may draw both strands as two lines, and we may include arrowheads on the lines to remind us of their anti-parallel direction. If we want to really remind ourselves that these lines are DNA held together by base pairing, we can draw vertical lines connecting the DNA to indicate the base pairs. They don't have to be molecularly accurate. They're just there to remind us of what we're looking at. Very often, what we care about in DNA is the sequence. So often we will write the sequence of the DNA. We won't bother drawing the DNA or making a line at all. We'll simply represent the sequence. Again, the sequence is by convention. We write the sequence of a single strand. Because the information is redundant, we don't need to write the information of both strands. We can always infer the information of the second strand from the information of the first strand. We always write the single strand from 5' prime end on the left, 3' prime end on the right. Sometimes there are circumstances when we actually want to consider both strands of the DNA. For instance, in um, Module 2, when we're talking about mutations, this will be important. And in those cases, we may draw the DNA, the sequences of both strands. In that case, the second strand is written in the opposite orientation, from 5' prime to 3' prime, so the DNA can be shown correctly base paired. Now, Here's an example of a very simple representation. You saw this in the previous slide, but it's easier now for you to interpret it. The two lines represent the two strands of DNA. with cross hatches indicating that they're base paired, and then they come apart and are single strands of DNA. The wavy line is representing RNA, and I've drawn it slightly thicker just to distinguish it from the DNA, and I've also drawn it kind of wavy. Um, this helps us to remember that it's a different molecule, and I draw it wavy because RNA molecules are intrinsically more flexible, being single-stranded, than DNA molecules are. So this is RNA. I've drawn a protein that's acting on the DNA. It, in this particular case, it's an RNA polymerase, but it could be any protein. And I've simply represented it as an oval, a blob, with an arrow on it to indicate that it's moving. So all of that information is conveyed in this very simple set of lines on a page. Now, there's another level of representation that's also extremely inaccurate, and that's that 
We draw the DNA as if it was stretched out neatly, but it's not. DNA molecules are far, far longer than the cells they're in. The sum of the chromosomes in any one cell is about a meter long, whereas the cell is about a hundred thousandth of a meter across. So the DNA has to be very tightly coiled to fit in the cell. And it's not just scrunched together at random, it's carefully packaged. So here's what we'd call naked DNA. This is rare in the cell, except at times of DNA, at, at places where the DNA is being directly copied. More commonly, almost all the DNA in the cell is initially compacted by being wound around proteins, um, producing a structure that's often described as a beads on a string. And then those beads with DNA wound around them are themselves wound around each other to make a thick fiber called the 30 nanometer fiber. You don't need to remember that. All of the inactive genes and the non-functional parts of the chromosomes are in this structure or in even more compacted forms in all of our cells, except when the cells are replicating. When the cells are actually dividing, the chromosomes need to be made even smaller so that the length of the chromosome is less than the width of the cell. And then those chromosomes are compacted even more by taking these fibers and again winding them up around each other. Now, here's a question for you. This is, um, again, as with the previous question, I'll show you the question, I'll introduce it, then you can answer it in the Coursera format before we'll come back and discuss it. So, here's a drawing, a representation of DNA, representing the two strands of a double helix. What's wrong with this figure? What's wrong with this figure is that the two strands are not shown as being anti-parallel. The two arrows indicate that the two strands are going in the same direction, as if we had the three prime ends of both of them together and the five prime ends of both of them together. This is a structure that's physically not possible. The bases can't pair with each other when they're in the same orientation at all. Even if an A is opposite a T, they can't form a base pair when their strands are running in the same orientation. So what have we done? We've talked about different ways to represent DNA, why we need to have ways to represent DNA. Unlike people who study mice or flowers, we can't see it at all. So we have important conventions that we can represent DNA by something as simple as a line, but if we're drawing a line, it represents DNA running in the th five prime to three prime direction. Um, we use error heads to indicate directions. Um, if we can write two strands, but we don't need to show two strands because the sequences are complementary. Now, coming up next in Lecture 1D, we're going to talk about the history of DNA, starting with the replication of DNA. I hope to see you there.